The mechanic for the panel is that will be between 10 to 15 minute presentation, so I, I'm gonna follow the, the time. You will get uh, my colleague uh, Matilde will show the time, and at the end of each uh, of all presentation, we'll have a session of question and answer. So the floor is yours. Uh. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, uh, now I guess we need the presentation. Uh, but before that, let me introduce myself again. My name is Kostadinos Gumas. Uh, I work at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. Uh, Joint Research Center, let's say it's the scientific branch of the European Commission. Uh, we do not do policy, but we support uh, through evidence uh, policy making. Uh, my presentation is based on a report we published recently back in June. Uh, it says the same title, The Future of Road Transport. Uh, in this report, we identified four game-changing issues uh, for road transportation. These are namely automation, connectivity, uh, decarbonization, and uh, shared mobility. Um, I will say some, f some more words about the JRC in the next slides, uh, but let's start with uh, the presentation, the next slide. Just to see uh, very quickly the situation in Europe and the influence of uh, transport to the EU economy, focusing on, on road transport. On the left side, you can see uh, that uh, passenger movement has been increasing since 1995, almost linearly, uh, almost constantly, while goods movement uh, has also been increasing, but it's very uh, well correlated to the GDP of um, uh, EU 28 countries. Uh, this means that when uh, there is a disruption in economy, uh, for example, when there was um, the crisis, also goods uh, transport uh, suffer. On the right side, you can see uh, which are the sectors that are affected by road transport. And uh, mainly this means that these sectors will be mainly um, affected by themselves uh, if there is a disruption. Not only automotive uh, industries, uh, but also other industries de deal with uh, transportation, for example, electronics and software, uh, telecommunication, uh, freight transport, and so on. In total, road transport accounts for 15% of um, uh, EU's uh, uh, gross value added. Uh, it also accounts for 10% of uh, European jobs. This means that if a disruption comes, uh, these figures may change and uh, will have a great impact also on people in, um, in, in the Union. Uh, I use this slide to um, set a bit, little bit the framework. Uh, closer, yeah. all right. Uh, transport systems are very com uh, complex intrinsically. From one side, uh, we have the supply, supply for infrastructures, services, and so on. From the other side, we have demand for infrastructures, demand for movement, and so on. Uh, when these two uh, things meet, uh, they uh, convert, let's say, to the level of service. Uh, if you provide more infrastructure, uh, in the first place, you have a better quality of service, uh, but uh, this will not endure for long in the sense that there are also uh, other issues that may affect uh, the transport system. For example, uh, the space accessibility, the household location, uh, the activities location in the sense that people will tend to move uh, to an area that has better transport. And at the end, you will saturate the infrastructure um, the same uh, and make it even more uh, worse than before. This goes in literature under the name of the Bryce paradox. Uh, another thing I want to highlight, another implication of uh, trans transport complexity uh, is uh, this mm, a little bit strange result in the sense that uh, we have made some analysis uh, for a reference scenario comparing the emissions in 2015 and those in 2015. Uh, and we can see from this graph that even though uh, there will be more um, transport activity, uh, at the end, due to larger energy efficiency and uh, the uh, correct mix of alternative fuels and uh, um, electrification, 
uh, it's very likely that we'll manage to uh, halve the emissions uh, by 2050. Uh, so this leads us to the way to address transport complexity uh, in overall. Uh, we propose uh, two things, one of them completing the first. Uh, first of all, a new government uh, that will uh, imply uh, better collaboration and cooperation between all actors that uh, are into um, uh, transportation. Uh, also a coordination by, pub by public authorities and uh, to aim for a system rather than a selfish uh, perspective, uh, not for the best of uh, the individual user, but for the best of the system. This can be aided uh, by the use of living labs. Living labs are platforms, are organisms uh, where technology and users uh, can interact. Uh, they represent a uh, real -time, time environment and they're also the place for co-creation and uh, co-design. Uh, this slide uh, means to be a little bit provocative and uh, the sense is this, uh, technology by itself uh, will not make things better. Here you can see a very large road, so have a lot of infrastructure and uh, many modern vehicles, uh, but what lacks is coordination, uh, coordination and uh, cooperation. Uh, the question is, is this the future of uh, road transport that we envision? Uh, do we want a car-centric uh, transport? Uh, the answer is that we need a new transport governance uh, where connectivity and automation uh, uh, will lead the way to uh, new governments that will enable better management of the demand and uh, also the demand and supply interaction uh, that convert into capacity. Uh, we uh, make our case that publicly orchestrated central platforms um, may define some further principles for accessing the road and uh, for routing vehicles. Uh, in this way, they can optimize the existing and new infrastructure, uh, also to maintain transport, uh, transport efficiency high and to control the energy consumption. Um, just a few more words about the living lab concept I mentioned earlier. Uh, living labs uh, are mostly aiming to test technology performance, um, receiving direct feedback by users. Uh, they involve the users and they don't involve only the people that um, are working on the technologies, making um, the system more equitable. Um, they give the possibility to test real life in a real life environment uh, complex interactions between uh, technologies and uh, systems and subsystems. And they also facilitate the co-creation and co-design uh, between um, uh, designers, uh, startup companies, and uh, so on. Uh, this is, these are in a nutshell uh, the road transport challenges we're facing today. Uh, first of all, uh, not in a, uh, an order of importance, congestion. It's a, it is um, calculated that between an one and two percent of European GDP is um, uh, lost in, congest in congestion. Uh, if you take the 15 more congested uh, European um, cities, uh, approximately 45 hours are lost uh, in congestion in uh, Paris, if I recall well, and 100 hours in the most congested uh, big city, London. Second issue, uh, accidents, accident rate. We had in 2018 more than 25,000 people dying on the roads. Uh, this number is huge. It's a lot better than <coughs> the figure we had in 2010, <coughs> which if I recall well was uh, 32,000, but it's still, <coughs> sorry, a long way from our aims uh, to halve uh, 2010 figures uh, in 2020. So actions need to be taken also on that front. Third, pollution. Transport nowadays is the only sector with increasing greenhouse, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Uh, in particular, road transport accounts for 70% of all uh, transport emission across all modes. The way forward. Uh, what we have today is sometimes an uncoordinated competition uh, between different service providers and lack of leadership uh, from the different, different uh, transport authorities. This leads uh, to an unbalanced uh, service and capacity provision. 
to a demand that uh, uh, can vary uh, within uh, months or years. Uh, different energy use, uh, <coughs> a lot of emissions and uh, traffic jams. Um, we make our case that in order to move forward, we need to regulate road access, uh, and technology can be a name to that. Uh, also to route and, uh, reroute and coordinate vehicles um, through platforms, uh, publicly, pu publicly orchestrated platforms. Um, then, uh, this is a classic case for the na last 30 years or so, uh, to upgrade public transport. Uh, nowadays, public transport suffer a lot, suffers a lot. If you think about uh, ride-hailing schemes, for example, al also in the US, they manage to uh, attract customers from public transport instead, instead of attracting customers from um, private vehicles. Uh, and finally, promote more sustainable uh, transport modes, which of course need to be uh, are regulated in the, pro in the appropriate way. With, this, uh, with that sli last slide, I had practically closed my presentation. I just want to highlight um, the support we provide to the JRC to the uh, European Commission uh, for policy making. Um, as I mentioned, this presentation is based on the report The Future of Road Transport, which was published in, uh, back in the summer. Um, only last week we published another report, uh, Digital Transformation in Transport, Construction, Energy, Government, and Public Administration. Uh, administration. It goes a little bit more deeper on uh, some technical um, uh, issues uh, regarding transport, for example, on the cyber security for data transfer. Um, and uh, of course we have also other material that's available through uh, the Joint Research Centers, Centers portal. Uh, one more thing, uh, for, for us knowledge management is very important uh, for policy making and also for supporting research and innovation. Uh, we publish very often uh, policy briefs from the work we do uh, that may support different initiatives of the Commission. For example, this one uh, is scheduled to be published later today and it focuses on um, technologies that deal with um, uh, the EU um, Green Deal that is being discussed today but, uh, by our President. Uh, it focuses on uh, technologies that have been researched in European projects and programs and it is based, uh, the analysis are based on the Transport Research and Innovation Monitor Information System database which holds more than 7,000 European and member state uh, funded uh, projects and programs uh, for research and innovation uh, in transportation. I mentioned before a couple of times uh, the notion of living labs. We have an open call at the JRC uh, to attract uh, startup companies, developers, uh, other companies and uh, authorities to test uh, new technologies. We have already received some concrete proposals. We're going to test uh, last mile, mile delivery by drones. We're going to test uh, automated uh, robot taxis and so on. And this will be tested in a closed environment but with uh, interaction with people that visit the site. This closing site, uh, um, slide gives me also the opportunity to talk about uh, a little bit more about the geolocation of the JRC. We are located um, 60 kilometers uh, west of Milan, uh, near the uh, Lake Maggiore. Uh, we have more than 100 buildings uh, or in an area of over 170 hectares. And we have regularly, I mean, on a daily basis, um, more than 2,000 people between staff and visitor visit, uh, staff and visitors uh, visiting the site. Uh, this makes the site also ideal for testing uh, new technologies. And with this, I'm done. Thank you, Constantino, and please congratulate him for this great presentation. <laughs> I was thinking when, when you present, uh, give the speech, uh, the future of road transport, right? And how difficult is when we lock in some technologies because we don't think forward. And there was a case, let me share the experience in Chile. Chile implemented an interesting BRT system, massive transport system, but before doing that, Pablo is not here, unfortunately, but before doing that, there was some setback, right? It didn't work as expected in the beginning. And what happened is that people start buying their own cars. 
right? So I don't have public transport, I need to get into, the, uh, into my job, right? And when you get into this technology, probably you don't want to go back to public transportation. And this, you can see there was a big jump, it was a discrete jump, basically, in the number of cars in the, in the market, right? And that contributed to congestion. So it's very important to think when we try to work in the cities, that we work in, the, uh, in Latin America or in Africa or, or, or in South Asia, when we think is when we provide transport solution, how we use these technologies, how we use that data in order to avoid this locking in in some technology. A question for you, but it's going to be probably for the question, uh, for the, um, when we have the question and answer from the audience, it's going to be about how we link this discussion with the urban planning, right? So at the end, this, this story doesn't happen in a vacuum, and we need to design cities in a way that basically complement with the our way that we produce or we supply transport. Have a question to think about this is how we use data for TOD. Right, so at the end we are collecting data for many reasons, but one could be for to develop this transport-oriented initiative. So that will be a question for you when we come to that session. I will pass the microphone to Anne uh, and um, to learn about the French experience as a transport regulator. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you uh, to the uh, thanks to the organizer for inviting me the World Bank and the Toulouse School of Economics. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here and share with you the um, experience of a regulatory agency, so uh, provide a practitioner point of view on regulation. So, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm representing here the French uh, Transport Regulatory Authority, ART, uh, which has just been renamed because we we change our name on October the 1st, and I will explain why. So this is the point of view, this is my point of view, but I represent the uh, French Regulatory Authority. So briefly to introduce uh, the uh, IRT, uh, we are an independent multimodal transport regulatory authority, an economic regulator, not a regulator of, s of safety or security, a regulator of uh, economic, ec the economics of, of transport uh, monopolies. We first, uh, we were born as a rail regulator, so with a traditional mission of um, controlling the um, exercise of the market power by uh, the rail infrastructure managers. Uh, and so this means that we, uh, we control through uh, binding opinions on charges, for instance, access charges. So we control that the access condition to the network, to the rail infrastructure, which is composed not only on of the network, but also on of service facilities like stations, for instance, or depots, maintenance centers. So we control that the and make sure that these access conditions are fair, transparent, and non-discriminatory in order to prepare the um, opening up of the market on the of the of the downstream market uh, of service of transport services. Then in 2015, uh, the um, Coach, intercity coach uh, transport service market was liberalized in France. It did not exist before 2015. There was no not such market because rail was predominant. And with the uh, liberalization of this market, we became uh, responsible of the uh, regulation of the access condition to the coach station, intercity coach station, as well as um, uh, of the... Um, a control of the absence of impact on the economic equilibrium of um, subsidized services. In, in economic, in academic uh, words, that is, uh, we uh, prevent the intermodal cream scheme, the existence of intermodal cream scheming, and look at uh, if a new coach service um, open, uh, look at the impact it has on subsidized rail services. And we're able to uh, forbid or accept the operation of such services if uh, we accept if there's no cream scheming. We were also um, given the um, mission to monitor the highways concessions in France. There was a big debate at that time uh, on the, uh, the rent of the highway concessionaires in France and a big debate uh, focusing on the lack of transparency of what they did, how much money they made and uh, uh, what uh, what the uh, what was the proper level of toll road uh, paid by users? So uh, we became in charge of the monitoring of these iOS concessions, meaning that we uh, look at the uh, justification provided by the concessionaires to increase toll roads, 
when they uh, invest in new operation, when they ask for more money to uh, make new investment that are not part of the initial concessions. And the second aspect of this uh, mission is to control the procurement procedures, that is the procurement committees and the procurement rules that these concessionaires uh, have uh, when they attribute uh, market for uh, works, uh, or services, for instance. Lastly, so on October the 1st, we became in charge of economic regulation of airport charges. So we look at the WAC conditions for uh, big airports of more than 5 million uh, passenger per year. So that's a new, uh, a new mission. Uh, there were no independent regulator per se. There was a, well a regulator, but uh, it's now uh, our, our mission to regulate this, um, this aspect. And uh, very soon, as soon as the what we call the LOM, the Loi d'Orientation de Mobilité, will be uh, adopted, so uh, maybe uh, end of December or January, depending on how long the strikes last, uh, we will be in charge of the uh, regulation, the traditional regulation, that is uh, regulation of the uh, rail, uh, Parisian Rail Infrastructure Manager, the RATP, <laughs> if it works again at one point. Uh, and uh, we will also, w something which is more innovative, we will be in charge of controlling the um, compliance of transport data producers to their the European obligation to open their data. So that's the uh, first part of the mission as we got transport data. And we will also be in charge of controlling the neutrality of the algorithm used by the um, the provider of multimodal information, transport information, so the neutrality of the algorithm they use to provide multimodal information. So uh, you, may, you may think uh, that uh, there may be some trouble if uh, the provider of multimodal information is also a market player on the transport service uh, market. He may want to uh, favor uh, the appearance in the um, on the platform of uh, its own company rather than of other uh, competitors. So that's what we will be supposed to look at, whether the algorithm used is neutral. But the law has not been adopted yet. So this is who we, who we are. Uh, and um, this evolution, you see, toward a multimodal regulation that we have seen uh, since our creation in 2009, is in line with the evolution of the of the market of the market for transport services, which is itself partly uh, a consequence of digitization. So uh, no need to explain, uh, but uh, that uh, digitization has lots of benefits for consumer. It means, for instance, new usages of uh, existing modes like car sharing or coach in France, because the coach uh, market, uh, in fact, is dominated by digital operator and not by transport operators. Uh, it means also digitization, uh, new entrants uh, in uh, and, and increased supply of services. Uh, the example is Uber. New tools to compare transport modes and to compare prices. That is new, to new tools also to improve multimodality and have a sim seamless um, route uh, journey. So it m this means comparators, route planners, interoperable ticketing systems. So this is for the benefit of consumers and may increase uh, their utility. It also means um, increased capacity to characterize and target demand uh, through big data. So this is on the supplier's side, but it is also on the regulator side. This is what I'm going to explain. And obviously it, mean it means increased intermodal competition thanks uh, in particular to these new comparators of transport modes, transport quality and prices. So it means competitive pressure, not only intermode, but also competitive pressure put on monopolies on the particular sectors. This is the, ca the case for rail, which is not open to competition for now in France. Okay. But digitization is also an opportunity for regulators. It's an opportunity to have a, a real data-driven regulation. So nothing new, in, in, in fact, because uh, data is the raw material of regulators. I mean, uh, 
This is the origins of uh, an independent economic regulation. This is not in Toulouse that I'm going to explain why, but uh, the existence of market failures, in particular information asymmetries and state failures, risk of capture, for instance, is at the origin of uh, the, um, the birth of independent economic regulators. That uh, digitization is a way to reduce information asymmetries or to increase our capacity to reduce it. So it means, new, this new technology, more capacity for regulators to collect, process, stock data on the upstream market, the infrastructure market, but also on the downstream market, the service market. It's a way to know better what monopoly do, their cost function, so open the black box of these monopolies, provide more incentives, incentives and, and targets that are based on real data and, and not, not only on models, because it's always contestable, especially in front of courts, while concrete real data uh, are more difficult to challenge uh, when you appeal to a court and be more efficient uh, ourselves as a regulator. But the necessary conditions, because I'm in the real world, is to have legal power to collect data and sanction non-cooperative behaviors. And this is only recently that we got this power, so meaning that we, we had the power to collect data, but the power to sanction uh, the absence of cooperation by uh, transport uh, providers, transport service providers, was, no, was not credible because there were no uh, sanction committee, for instance. So you may be have something in the law that say that you, uh, you can collect data. If you don't have a credible uh, enforcement power, uh, you cannot use it. And it also means uh, financial and human resources to become a data cruncher. So you may have the power, credible threats to enforce this power to collect data, if you don't have financial and human resources, then um, you cannot do uh, a proper job and you cannot benefit from digitization. So examples of what we've done, so data collection campaigns. So this is not very innovative, but this, this was a, a very important, um, it's a very important part of, of what we did. Uh, several decisions uh, to collect data from the various regulated companies on at different uh, frequencies. Uh, and this, um, this gave us the opportunity to collect data at a very disaggregated level. Uh, and these data did not exist before. They exist, but nobody uh, uh, provided them and, and public published them. Uh, this is obviously a challenge, and we have uh, several, inf several appeals and several uh, um, infringement procedures that were initiated. So it's not very easy. I mean, operators are very reluctant but we won <laughs> before the Council of State, so these appeals against our decisions were, um, uh, were rejected. So once again, it's first a legal battle, and then it's, uh, it's a technical one. Uh, other types of action, so all our data, all the data we, uh, we collect are open, so we have uh, on the our website, you can find, download all the data we use at the very disaggregated level on the various uh, sectors we um, we regulate. We, uh, we made partnerships with academics to for academics to exploit our data for their own research, but also for us to uh, have more ideas and uh, be able to analyze properly or use new tools, econometric tools that we don't know or that we don't have time to investigate. Uh, we made user surveys, so lots of user surveys, and this uh, concretely, this helped us to update our regulatory hypothesis, and we use this new hypothesis that we got from the user surveys to change our decisions, our regulatory decisions. So for instance, the pricing unit of access charges, the price elasticity of demand, which, which are variables we use to regulate, we change them uh, as a consequence of user surveys, so as of the data we, uh, we collected uh, on an on, uh, individual basis. We report and, and benchmark a lot thanks to this data. The reports we publish uh, are very helpful in, the, in some sectors or for some missions where we don't have binding powers, meaning that we can we give opinion, we, we, we publish opinion, but these opinions are non-binding, so the operators may do what they want. Uh, when we publish reports benchmarking some results, it has impact a lot of. I gave you the example of our role I, not I mentioned the example, the, our role, sorry, uh, in the highway concessionaires, uh, the opinion we gave and the report we published, I mean, the, this is just sunshine regulation, but it, it had an impact uh, which we can measure in terms of euros, hundreds of euros. 
because they had to change their investment plan uh, as a consequence of our report. We also uh, more recently organized a datathon together with the, energy, the French energy regulators uh, to get more direct information uh, or to provide, sorry, more direct information to final customers. So the idea was to uh, end up with uh, an app uh, that could be uh, used by the customers and to, to give them more, uh, inform, uh, more information. So it just gives you an example. So this is the, the flyer of the data turn. So there were several challenges. We had lots of participants. And, and one of the prize winning project was um, Projet Meteorai, which uh, so after two days uh, uh, locked in a <laughs> room, this uh, one of the team uh, came uh, with the an app uh, on the quality of transport service, an application predicting train delays and predicting uh, train delays depending on the, the reason of the delay. So just it's it looks like this. So you want to go from uh, Paris to Toulouse on uh, lundi 18 mars on March 18th. Uh, this is not today, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so they predict uh, with the data we provide them, some of them are open, with the data they could get on the uh, Rail Infrastructure Manager API, they uh, uh, they can predict the, the likelihood of delay and the reason why you will have a delay. So for instance, from Paris to Toulouse, the user interface would be like that with the prediction, uh, the likelihood of... So this is an, just an example. Th these are fake <laughs> results. 50% of likelihood of incident between Paris of Toulouse. The reality is, is, is higher. <laughs> so <laughs> and, and you have the, the reason, uh, the origin, uh, the potential origin of the delay. So whether it's... Uh, it's because of rolling stock or infrastructure, poor, poor infrastructure maintenance, so things like that. So this is the idea, and we would like, so it's a project so far, uh, we would like to implement it, but we need time and resources, but uh, the one of the team uh, during the data turn uh, made this. So as a conclusion, yeah. Uh, so lots of challenges uh, with the digitization uh, when it comes to regulation of the transport sector. So new demands on our sides in terms of skill sets, tools, and the appropriation of new technologies. So uh, we created recently uh, a market monitoring and transport data science unit, and we, uh, we are recruiting transport data or data science scientists. Uh, this means also expanded scope of data. Uh, we, are, we, are, we have in mind to uh, be able to get data from the crowd, from the users, to, so crowdsourcing, uh, may be able to um, have a simulation-based approach, use comparison engines. For instance, one idea we have is to use mobile phone digital footprint and GPS history to characterize travel flows on an even more um, disaggregated level than what I mentioned before. Uh, and but we are we are very uh, we are very confident and uh, we are sure that it, it will have a big impact uh, because infrastructure and service monopolies are very far from final users, especially in the rail sector. So uh, these data, these tools will uh, increase transparency and increase performances bec uh, in these sectors. This is also a way to uh, once again provide. Um, rationality, bring rationality into, into the public debate. This is something very important in sectors that are highly subsidized uh, where and highly politicized, where you have political interference to bring rationality, transparency, data, and facts in the debate. This is part of our role too. And uh, last but not least, uh, transport, it's not only a question of transport operators, infrastructure. There are uh, emerging operators who are digital, and, and as I mentioned, they are not transport operators. They know nothing about trains, cars, uh, coach. They are, no, uh, they are only digital. So they have new business models and we really need to adapt uh, the way we think and work uh, to, um, to be in line with market's evolution. This is hopefully what we'll be able to do uh, once the, this new law is passed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anne, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, and I ima imagine that being a transport regulator, when we have these disruptive technologies, uh, it changing the way that you are looking for the same problem, right? And this morning, Jean Tirol was referring, and I was a bit surprised uh, somehow that a lot of competition policy, rather than the standard regulation that we are more familiar with. 
Something that you mentioned, but it will be interesting to discuss later on, I is how the, this the routing technology, the access to this data, is changing the procurement process. It's changing the way that we procure the projects, the way that we design, when we talk about PTPs, for instance, whether it makes sense for, for the government to lock in some technologies that knowing that something will happen, and how we design contracts in terms of KPIs, right? Because we have much more information on buses, on trains, or, 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 or arrivals at the airport. I know that this is not the job of the transport regulator, but I wonder whether, we discussed before, but maybe you can explain what is your role regarding the procurement authority passing this information and sharing this platform of information. Thank you, Anna. I, th I think we will move now to the presentation of Yannick Perez. I don't know if uh, Yannick is connected. Uh, I'm supposed to. Oh, thank you, Yannick. Thank you, um, <laughs> and uh, thank you for making it. So we are seeing your presentation. I'm not seeing you in the screen. Um, the, the slides are much more oh, nice. I need my worry. glasses to see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fa fantastic. Uh, Yannick, uh, I, I'm delighted you are here because you are talking about the subject that I was not aware that exists, which is using electric vehicles to provide ancillary services. No? Is the, yes. the, the regulatory but challenge. That's and, the um, point. Excellent. And uh, frankly speaking, I think this presentation is great because also we'll, we'll, we'll go also with the presentation on the, on the energy group, is, which is happening in the other venue, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, Yannick, I, I let you go to this presentation. This is a 15-minute discussion. Um, maybe you can do a brief introduction what you what you are working on these days and then go to the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. And I'm very sorry uh, not to be here with you in Toulouse, uh, but uh, I'm stuck in Paris <coughs> for many different reasons. One is mobility and the other one is uh, family constraints. Uh, but I'm very happy to, to present you uh, this, um, uh, this work I am doing since the last uh, seven years in uh, Central Supélec, which, uh, as you, you precise, is an engineering school in Paris the merger of Central and, and Supélec. And in this uh, school, we, we used to try to, um, try to think about the, the future of uh, mobility in Central and uh, electricity in Supélec. So uh, we were asked by many different companies to try to see how uh, we could use electric vehicles to provide grid electric services. And uh, as I'm an economist, I'm not very concerned about, uh, um, let's say, how we make the car or uh, how the computers uh, are used or how the links uh, between the computers, the pieces, the elements, et cetera, are used. But I'm more interested on the regulatory challenge to try to see how uh, electric vehicles could make a bridge between mobility on the one hand and um, electricity sector on the other hand. Uh, why is it interesting? Uh, when I started to work on this issue in 2012, it was uh, a pure research interest. Uh, but uh, since the last years, uh, we see now uh, more and more electric vehicles on the road, both on terms of personal cars, but also on buses, on electric buses, which are uh, starting to develop. And it means that for uh, all the OEMs, so the operators uh, building cars, uh, basically, on the last 10 years, the strategy was uh, roughly to uh, increase the size of the batteries uh, in the electric car or in the buses, which means that today we have uh, very large batteries on wheels with computers and uh, internet connections and uh, sometimes uh, 4G or 5G connection. So we could uh, do a lot of things because we have at the same time battery and IT and connections to uh, provide different type of services to people who may need it. So electric cars today save more energy than the daily use, which is big, a bit strange because everyone is concerned about the small size of the battery, uh, which is in the car. But in fact, if you look at the daily use, uh, we have batteries which are too large. Today, the size of the battery goes from 24 kilowatt hour for the small ones to 100 uh, kilowatt hour for the larger one. An EV consumes roughly between 15 and 20 kilowatt hour per 100 kilometers. And the mean driver distance per day is 24 kilometers in France, 40 in the US. So we have a lot of energy that we don't use every day. Of course, people are concerned about long range mobility but long-range mobility, it's a couple of trips per year, 
whereas uh, on their day-to-day -day life, the size of the battery is way too large for their personal mobility. So it means that electric vehicles are a very flexible resource uh, in terms of electricity provision because we could absorb energy or we could deliver energy uh, if needed. And we have a new type of uh, device in the electric system that could be called distributed storage services, meaning that this battery could be charged or discharged and it could deliver services to someone who wants to pay for it. So there is a new arbitrage between uh, private use of my car in my house or in my building or over flexibility buyers that could be interested to buy storage electricity uh, or for charging or for discharging on energy market or on transmission grids or distribution grids. <clears throat> Why do we look at that? It's because we want the electric cars to be cheaper. Uh, you have uh, on the screen uh, three uh, total cost of ownership comparison between electric cars and internal combustion engines in France. So you compare the two small cars, uh, intermediate cars and compact cars. And thanks to the public subsidy, the total cost of ownership is lower for electric cars and for its equivalent. Uh, but of course, if you can provide additional services, uh, you will um, even more reduce that and probably one day uh, try to uh, go for um, a cost which is really, really reduced for electric cars. So the question comes, who needs flexible electricity storage? Who can be the buyers of my residual energy in my electric car? Uh, we have identified uh, different category of potential buyers. One could be the electricity market or the electric city grids uh, or the transmission system operator or the distribution system operators. But we can also imagine that uh, smart buildings or uh, houses uh, could uh, be uh, potential buyers. And in fact, what I would try to, um, to advocate is the fact that each segment, each service needs a specific analysis in terms of e economics and, and, and management of it, also a technical point of view. And for each of these cases, we are going to see that uh, there is a lot of uh, promises, but uh, some problems when we, it comes to uh, application. So there is three main sources of potential flows of revenues. Uh, on the wholesale market, there is potential markets in which we think EVs could contribute. At the utility side, there is three other services that uh, uh, EVs could contribute. And on the customer side, there is uh, the two mains uh, which are displayed on the screen. Uh, there is only 10 in this, uh, in this slide because I want it to be readable, but in fact, the last uh, um, evaluation we have made is up to 16 different services uh, on these three different blocks of potential revenues on the wholesale market, on utility point of view, and on the customer base. So what we are going to see is, uh, of course, not all these 10 or 16 potential services, but we are going to try to see a couple of them to see what are the problems and uh, what are the policy requirements or the regulatory requirements that will be needed in order to um, uh, allow this um, uh, flexibility, this distributed flexibility offered by fleets of electric cars to be used by different users in order to give value to uh, the final customers. If we look uh, at the first block, which is the electricity wholesale market, uh, the basic regulation of this is the fact that uh, these markets have been built for managing nuclear, gas, water uh, systems, meaning uh, very large producers, not uh, storage units and not uh, small storage units uh, dispersed all around the country. So uh, to make it simple, the rules, the actual rules and regulation on the electricity wholesale market are not adapted for a fleet of electric car providing services to the wholesale market. If you want more information with uh, my colleagues, uh, Olivier Born and Marc Petit, we did uh, um, uh, work on uh, trying to uh, see uh, the, uh, the, the limits of, uh, uh, of uh, a fleet of electric cars <clears throat> 
providing flexibility resources in the market. And the conclusion is that basically uh, most of the value is killed by an absence of a nice regulation. If now we move to the second block, which is the block of uh, which services we can provide to utilities, transmission system operators or uh, distribution system operators, more at local based, we will find roughly uh, the same issues. Uh, if we take the first example of a transmission system operator, uh, both in UK and in France, the two TSOs says that they would be happy to have a lot of electric cars providing them resources. Uh, in UK, uh, the estimation is 3.5 billion uh, pounds per year, and in France, it's uh, 1 billion uh, euros per year uh, in, at the horizon of the 2040 or 2030 for, for France. So everybody says, we should go for that, uh, and uh, we were very happy because uh, we think it's a good idea. But, of course, uh, without regulatory adaptation, uh, it's just a plan because uh, the actual rules and regulations are for the transmission system operators in terms of market design. They are not really ready for having this type of services delivered by fleet of electric cars. So on the one hand, we say for 2040 it would be nice, but actually we cannot make it because the rules and regulations are not adapted to it. Uh, we try to make a survey for uh, Europe, but we stop at four countries because it was too complicated to, to make uh, 27 uh, studies to see uh, what are the barriers to entry in, the, in this uh, frequency regulation market for TSOs, and uh, we stop at four, so we still have some homework to do. But uh, the conclusion is basically that uh, most of these markets are um, not adapted to uh, a fleet provision. Yannick, sorry, you have yes. five minutes. Yeah, yeah it's okay. I, I have launched my own chronometer. <laughs> so uh, we have the same issue with distribution grids uh, because uh, electric cars could provide uh, uh, local provision of, uh, of flexibility with two good things for distribution grids because uh, as the car are moving, they can go where and when it is needed for uh, the distribution system to, uh, to be helped. Uh, but there is a tariff design issue, which is quite large. I have no time to develop it, but uh, we have a paper on that with uh, Quentin Waro, which tried to see that depending on how the regulator sets the tariff, uh, he can uh, help or, um, or not the diffusion of uh, PV panels and uh, electric vehicles, which are the two main innovations in the sector. So what we are claiming is the fact that we need a, a new regulation for uh, distributed storage solutions. Uh, it seems to be needed because the actual situation does not cover this, uh, this element. Uh, we did not cover all the potential services because it's still uh, uh, an ongoing work. Uh, but we think that we have a couple of evidence uh, that we need uh, economics and technical rules adaptation uh, to be developed on the case by case, depending on how many um, needed um, flexibility provision you want to, to assess. My conclusion on terms of public policy, uh, we would uh, need probably to have a work on the standardization, because today it's... Uh, um, connecting a, a, a car to uh, any type of environment is uh, a really tough challenge. It's very far from plug and play. Uh, there is a, a lot of uh, different standards uh, which are not uh, working together. Uh, we have also a big problem with rooming uh, because if you want to move your car across Europe, you will have to uh, find a solution for more than five thousand different charging point operators, which means uh, a huge rooming battle. And there is all the problems of uh, data collection and usage, because uh, everybody in the industry wants to be the guy who manages uh, the data, going from the core manufacturer to the electric system to the data scientist, etc., etc. The last point is, of course, the barrier to entry. Most flexibility markets are today built for large players and not for small. And uh, in most countries, we don't have a clear definition of what a storage <clears throat> device is and how it should be regulated or not. So at the end, the question is uh, who the EVs are going to help, the energy markets, the grids, the behind the meter use in-house, 
or the electrification of uh, rural areas, which are not included in the 16 uh, different services we, we have analyzed so far. And the answer will depend, of course, on regulatory decision and economic evaluation that should be made country by country, depending on the problems of mobility on the one hand and the electricity sector on the other hand. And if we want EVs to play with energy market, transition grid and distribution grid, we will need a regulator to make the change in the rules to allow them. And if there is no cooperation between electricity and mobility, then a uh, solution will be only provided where the regulators have no hands and nothing to do, which is uh, behind the matter, so in buildings, in home, and uh, for a project of electrification out of the scope of uh, <clears throat> the electrical uh, networks. And uh, thank you very much. I hope I, I will make my, uh, my point clear and uh, that you enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Yannick. Let's congratulate him. And let me say that you did it perfectly on time. Actually, you say one minute, so thank you for, for this. Um, and I was wondering when you mentioned that we need regulation, and I also look at the presentation of Anne and say that you are working with the uh, Commission de Regulation de Electricité, the French uh, regulatory, the uh, French Energy Regulatory Commission, right? So I think yes. there's a lot of uh, regula common regulation that need to be done. Uh, just to just a question which uh, is not clear to me uh, before we move to the next presentation. This is a kind of idea of kind of cogeneration, the approach that you are suggesting, or is uh, something different? In, in fact, it's, uh, the, the, the it's not a cogeneration. It's the fact that uh, you, you have a car which has a large battery, a computer, and a connection to uh, uh, a communication device and an energy device. And the point uh, is, do you want this car to be uh, stupid and just to charge uh, when he plug, or do you want him to charge when the building or the network needs it? Or do you want him to provide services if the network or the house or the building needs it? And uh, if you want the car to be silly, no problem, he, he is today. Uh, and if you want him to uh, get the, f the maximum uh, ability and smartness it can deliver, we need to agree on the, which type of services, which type of communication, who's managing, and uh, which flows of revenues between the different actors. Thank you, Yannick. We will move to the next presentation, and it's going to be the time for my colleague from the World Bank, Alejandro Molnar. Uh, we change the subject, and actually we move to, to congestion, right? And we have actually two presentations, one by Alejandro and the second by Gabriel. Um, we we'll start with Alejandro uh, on the impact of ride sharing on congestion in New York. So the floor is yours, uh, Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think my is this the first slide? Can I go back? Oh, yes. Okay. Hi. Thank you. So. Um, I just wanted to start by overviewing some of the new changes to transportation modes, uh, data, and the policy choices they entail. So we have all these new types of new transportation alternatives, which involve sharing um, cars and, in some countries, motorcycles and other vehicles, as well as sharing not, not just sharing them through rides, but through car share, so sharing the, the capital. There is the ability to do carpooling on these. There's these new mo mobility solutions such as either docked or dockless bikes, e-bikes, scooters, etc. And, uh, and additionally, we have e-bikes. We might someday have autonomous vehicles, etc. So what what these have in common is that they change how people might move around the city or how they may use different parts of the city for different purposes in working or in uh, deriving amenities from the city. Um, at the same time as we get these uh, new types of transportations, there's new sources of data on what is going on in cities and how people move in cities. So a couple of uh, data sources that have been mentioned already are these big uh, data sources that uh, refer to individual locations. So call detail records allow us to know about how people are moving in the city with some granularity. And the second generation of this is data leaked from apps, right, that uh, uh, get packaged and sold to, for, for data analysis as well as the data that all of these new mobility providers collect from their users, which usually are in this kind of disaggregate form private data because of the uh, um, anonymity concerns. Uh, some of the providers provide uh, either as um, 
you know, uh, as part of their outreach programs, some statistics from this data or access to statistics. So Uber has pro is providing the street speed dashboard where we can learn about some statistics for street segments and Waze and Google Maps and a few others have provided um, ways to query the data to learn about uh, uh, speed, for instance, or flows. And in, as I'll talk about in a second, my own research, uh, we can also process taxi data collected by some regulators to, to study uh, ish, uh, transportation issues. There's also the combination of old, quote unquote, data with new tools in uh, machine learning. So we've, we have CCTVs in many cities, but now this is getting uh, kind of becoming more um, or, or allowing for new studies because we can apply algorithms to count cars from them or, or, or trucks, et cetera, pedestrians and satellite data to count kind of retrospectively uh, how many cars are on the road. And with the World Bank, for instance, has a program to, to, to study this data with a provider, Orbital Insights. Um, uh, uh, cities are putting sensors in vehicles or they are, for instance, using Bluetooth sensors to recover where people are moving in cities just because people tend to have Bluetooth devices in their vehicles and they're using this to provide de data. And as a Along with all of this, we just have the, the lower cost of IT, means that data that pre perhaps would have been prohibitive in the past to analyze, such as turnstile data from metro systems, et cetera, is now kind of something that an analyst can study on their, on their own computer. And okay, and so we have many policy choices, um, and one kind of, asp one type of policy choice that I'm interested in that is often studied in the US by transportation engineers rather than economists, but I think is ultimately an economic question is the issue of road dieting. How do we kind of use the space in the city for uh, different uh, modes, such as bus lanes, BRT lanes, bike lanes, as well as an emerging topic will be um, charging for parking and for access to the curb. And we have the issue of congestion, uh, pricing congestion, which uh, Gabriel will talk, talk about and uh, there are new generations uh, in this and that there's the potential of being able to do it at a, at a granular level as well as pricing other um, externalities in the city and you know, doing better on regulating things such as um, entry, licensing, etc. There's also the, uh, the trend for what's called mobility as a service, which uh, I'm interested in having a discussion about. I view kind of as a behavioral tool for kind of steering kind of how people use transit. Uh, it's kind of a term that the vendors use. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about uh, my own research on congestion in New York City. So I'll talk about this, uh, this is an existing paper, and then I'll talk about two uh, works in progress. So uh, in this paper on, on New York City, um, one thing we do with my co-author, who's Daniel Mangrum, a uh, student on the market currently, um, is we find that um, New York City traffic has slowed down on the order of 15 to 20 percent on this over the space of three years from 2015 to 2016 and we can measure this by just tracking comparable sets of taxi trips or segments on the on the highway using this type of era RFID data that I mentioned earlier from the easy pass system we then um, exploit a specific policy uh, event that took place in New York City which was the introduction of a new type of medallion taxi in which the New York City introduced a new type of taxi, but they were geofenced, so they could only uh, search for, uh, for fares in a particular area. So there are these areas which get additional taxis and areas that do not. And we wanted to study this policy, but we faced the data, the, the, the data challenge that this policy rolled out in 2013 prior to when we started collecting this data. So there wasn't any available Google type street speed or Waze type street speed data that we could use retrospectively. So we fortunately, the uh, New York City um, regulator put GPS meters in taxis in 2009, and these were uh, can be obtained now. Well, they could be obtained from from the city, and so with this, we use this to to build retrospective street speed data and study the impact of we have a, an area where there are all these additional taxis, and we can we can look at the impact that that has on street speed and estimate from this a congestion parameter. What happens when you have more vehicles on the street? And we're interested in measuring this in terms of vehicles, so we combine this with data from aerial imagery of the city, both before and after, so we have an idea of kind of where in the city are there more cars. And, the f uh, we, and we claim that with this, uh, with this exercise, we estimate a, a causal impact of adding vehicles uh, to the road. 
Then we do an, uh, an exercise of studying the impact of right tail. So this we wouldn't claim as a causal impact, we're just kind of putting the uh, a causal study, we're just putting the, some parts of our, of, of, of our work together. <laughs> so we use the, this aerial imagery to, to count how many vehicles are on the road and we find a substantial increase in for hire vehicles. And we, also and we also find that in midtown Manhattan, uh, traffic slowed down by this number I gave you earlier, about 15%. So we find that right hail can account, the impact from right hail that we estimate from, from the first part of work, work can account for at least 60% of the slowdown. And a few other stories that we might think might be part of that slowdown um, don't, th we don't believe are the case. Um, so that's one paper. And so I'll mention now two other things that, we're, that, that I'm working on that are related to the demand for infrastructure, again, in New York City. So one is New York City has been constructing uh, a lot of bike lanes. And so one thing we can think about is tag when, you know, exactly did a bike lane become on, you know, uh, operational or when was it constructed in New York City relative to, so, so we can have a, a, a before and after period for specific segments on the road. And we also have, uh, speed data for specific segments, and so we're interested in studying both the impacts of kind of deploying new bike lanes on traffic speed, as well as how this encourages people to travel by bike uh, versus other modes. Um, and lastly, I'll also mention, so another, uh, what I think will be uh, uh, an important topic is in, in dense cities such as New York City and, and many developing countries is um, the growth of e-commerce means that we have parcel delivery, right? And so we, uh, to study this fact, we're using the fact that in the US, uh, Amazon uh, has a specific sales date that happens on a particular date in July. And so what we were observing, since we have this really highly granular uh, speed data for different cities, and this we can do not only for New York City, uh, we're observing that in the delivery window right after the sales event, cities slow down. So we're quantifying that direct impact and we're also interested, we, we were interested in kind of using this to learn about the impact of, of, of roads on traffic. So that led us to collect uh, closed circuit TV uh, feeds, which are made available by New York City for over 400 cameras. So I've been collecting a few of these for several years. I'm now up to collecting 60 of these cameras uh, every minute. So I have an image like this one. And so you, what you can see in this image is this double parked UPS truck. And so this was just a, a day uh, a couple months ago. And what was sur very surprising, and so we have these images and the goal basically is to uh, use a, a, a deep learning algorithm to track basically flow on the road. And so what we are, this is not done uh, by any means, uh, still kind of early work, but we, we were surprised by two things. We were surprised by the extent and the duration of these double parking events. So it's typical that a UPS truck at that corner is par double parked for 30 minutes and there are many double parking events, but 30 minutes is the modal time. We've observed double parking events of up to four hours. Um, and the other thing that was completely surprising to me is that what typically happens is uh, space on the, on the curb clears and the, the UPS or other truck that's double parked moves and so it's no longer double parked. But what was surprising to me is that these uh, trucks, the same truck stays on the same corner because of the density of New York City and the amount of uh, purchases people are making on a regular day for the typical, uh, the typi on a typical day, seven, eight hours. So they, they essentially what these trucks are doing is they're mobile warehouses. They're like moving to a place. And from that place, you, b you can, from these images, you can just observe the delivery workers bringing parcels out of the truck for the entire day. Uh, while other double parking events take place. So I'm not exactly sure what will be ultimately in the paper, but you can, if you want to kind of know that this happens, I can sh show you that it happens in, in New York City. Um, so, um, so I think, so, so what are some policy options? And some policy options are congestion pricing, and there's a promise of kind of doing this at a more granular le level, and, and Gabriel will talk about her, his, his research. And uh, an issue here might be that uh, you know, the, the dead weight loss from this congestion might be low. It's, it's a, there's a big social cost from this congestion, but if people don't have alternatives, um, there, there might not be too much space for, uh, for this policy. And so the degree to which this is gonna happen in other cities is gonna depend to on things such as whether we have substitution alternatives or the degree to which infrastructure congests. Uh, I'm gonna skip over some of these other things, but we need to be mindful that lessons from New York City are not gonna transfer um, 
well. So I mean, so so in reg uh, uh, in regulating these new technologies has definitely been challenging in uh, in New York City. So I have here a quote about the ex the, the extremes to which. Um, Uber went to not be regulated in New York City. I think an interesting phenomenon was that in the city of Austin, Texas, um, Uber, uh, so the, the city passed a, a law to require drivers to be fingerprinted, which is an issue related to identifying the drivers, and that was the issue, is the outstanding issue in the driver ban of Uber in London currently. And so uh, Uber sponsored a, pro a proposition, a direct, basically a direct democracy uh, policy tool to that would go straight into the code in, in, in Austin uh, to prevent uh, fingerprinting, and they lost through popular vote. And so the day after they lost, they withdrew from the market. And this, then they started lobbying the state regulator, which basically precluded them, precluded the city from, from this regulation. So this is a challenge, and I think kind of um, raises the issue that uh, Cooperation between cities and or coming up with frameworks for for um, for regulation is important for cities, especially in the context of places where there's uh, there might be um, political conflict between a city and the and the state or region that governs it. Another interesting factor in the regulation of, of this in the U.S. is that whereas the U.S. both regulates the quantity and the fare of taxis, for instance, uh, the New York City regulator doesn't even know the price at which the Uber service is provided, right? Because this is something that company has tried to prevent, uh, not disclose, except there, there is been some disclosure. And so uh, just a quick point is that uh, data, f you know, for the purpose of, of doing research in this space, often data feeds are provided li live and they're aimed for developers and for people that are putting together apps, but not necessarily archived or kind of, uh, and so this is the case with, with two of the data streams that I've, that I've uh, just described. And even for these data streams, so camera, the storage costs are not prohibitive, but you know, the city has to see the option value of, of storing it, which kind of comes from this research, which is happens every once in a while. Um, and then obviously there's concerns with the data having uh, privacy implications for both passengers and the drivers. And so for instance, the New York City taxi regulator has more fine data than, than what I have used, uh, but they do not release any version of it due to privacy concerns and uh, are currently kind of anonymizing the data very aggressively, which prevents kind of the study that I just described could not be done today. Um, so I think the, a suggestion here is that uh, for urban transportation research, we might need some a, a new type of data model around the idea of something such as what in the US is the census research data center. So a data model where data can still be uh, you know, not public and there can be liability by the researcher uh, in using data, but uh, but that allows researchers access to microdata. So I'm done. Thank you, Alejandro. <laughs> uh, and thank you for sharing interesting ideas for Toulouse students. We know that in the urban space there is a lot of things to do, a lot of research, a lot of things that we can do and help countries with uh, fixing the urban issues that we are seeing. A couple of questions, Alejandro, we can think later on. One is that uh, it wasn't clear to me this tracking, uh, delivering uh, parcels in New York is a matter of regulation of enforcement. And second, a question that I discussed with you previously is, is well, yes, we can fix somehow congestion and something we can discuss with Gabriel, Gabriel later on. Uh, we can increase the price until we have the travel speed that we, we want to have or we expect to have, which would be acceptable but what kind of effect we count on equity, right? So, and, and we know that uh, I mentioned to you before in the case of Santiago de Chile, some years ago, we were advising the government on peak low pricing for tolls. Uh, and the problem is that there was no alternative uh, public transport. So just the Minister of Transport told us, well, if we toll during peak low uh, periods, it's gonna be like a salary tax, right? So it's not really because people have no option and jobs are in the determined place. So. We can have a discussion later on, move to Gabriel uh, for his interesting presentation also on congestion, but now we move to, from a different city, we'll move to Bangalore uh, via on a case study on the effect of road congestion pricing. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to tell you about this project that was um, the main work I did uh, during my PhD. Um, okay, so one thing that 
large cities throughout the world have in common is that uh, at the same time as um, economic growth, um, we they also exhibit a lot of congestion. And there are many congestion forces, but and traffic congestion is a very salient one. If I ask you to think about a thriving city in a, a developing country and to imagine it, uh, you might very well see the kind of gridlock that, that, that I'm showing there. And of course, this is a problem um, because it may dampen the type of growth that creates this congestion in the first place. And specifically, as economists, we're worried about this because of the externalities that are involved. So my driving on the road uh, slows down everyone else. That's at least one of the externalities. Uh, and that's a cost to society that I'm not taking into account. And so we'd, we'd like to realign uh, individual incentives with, uh, with um, all of society's incentives. And as economists, we one way to implement this. So there may be many things to do uh, to improve traffic congestion in s large cities in developing countries before getting to congestion pricing. Maybe it's a problem of making the engineering systems more efficient in terms of traffic light, in terms of enforcement of road uh, rules and so on. Um, but one thing that immediately comes to mind as economists and that economists have studied theoretically a lot is bridging that gap between the personal cost and the social cost with a, with a congestion toll. Uh, and that should be designed to exactly offset, or as closely as possible, what we'd like is for, for, for it uh, to bring these two, um, uh, these two costs in line. And this is something, congestion pricing for Peguvian reasons is very rare in the world. Uh, however, I think a lot of what we've seen today is that technologically we're moving towards a situation where it will be easier and easier to implement, at least from the point of view of technology. The one example in the world where something like this is, is rolling out uh, next year is Singapore, where the second generation of the electronic road pricing is going to be based on GPS data distant and, and it will face different, tax, uh, different charges for different distances. So let's consider for, for the purpose of this presentation that, that this, um, this is a solution that a city is, is exploring and wants to implement. And assuming they have the support and this is something that may happen, one of the challenges that uh, comes up is um, to understand how much to charge. And it also be interesting to understand what kind of impact that would have on some measure of commuter welfare. And here, the fundamental tension is that, of course, charging more is going to improve speeds. But at some point, that will be uh, inefficient. That will be charging too much. So you'll be able to travel very fast. However, you'll be suppressing too much travel. So you'll be charging more than, than what this um, um, uh, what this externality uh, uh, motivates. And um, there are also distributional concerns that have already been mentioned. So the purpose of the study, uh, and my goal in this presentation is to, to showcase, to give one example of a, a kind of toolkit of how you could go about to answer this type of question in a, part in, in a given city. And the, there are two parts to it. So one is to measure essentially how would commuters respond to different types of pricing. And to do that, the, the innovation, the new part in this study is to do that through small real world experiments um, that allow to, to see in the current situation before any kind of system is implemented, how commuters would react. Um, the second part goes back to um, a, a, a point that uh, Konstantinos made earlier that the whole traffic system is, um, has a lot of feedbacks and is very complicated, uh, is to understand now if everywhere, if all the drivers in the city were priced, how the whole system would adjust. And that, uh, in this paper I do with the, and, and the established method to do it is with a simulation model um, that I'll talk more about. So I will be looking at the city of Bangalore uh, in India and specifically at one policy, uh, which is peak hour pricing. And here, um, I want to, to, to clarify from the beginning, the. Um, it's important to specify which margin of adjustment uh, th this looks at, and I'm focusing on, on how commuters could change when they travel, uh, still travel, still use their private vehicles, but travel at different times. That'll be the relevant margin, just to keep in mind. Okay, so how does this happen uh, in practice? What does one do? So um, in order to understand how commuters would respond, we first collected um, a, sample, a, a sample of commuters um, and these were drivers, um, commuters who had a car or a motorcycle, and they were recruited in gas stations. So surveyors went up to them, invited them to participate in the study with a, with a well-rehearsed uh, 
uh, pitch. Um, and what the study consisted uh, from the point of view of the participants was a very short survey and installing an app that collected data about how they travel. So the app worked in the background of their smartphone, didn't bother them, and collect regular um, GPS locations, which were then con reconstructed into, into trips that these people made. Now, uh, there's a parallel, and I'll go back and forth. So this was done for the purpose of a research study. Uh, I'll also uh, uh, talk more about it. Um, there are commercial versions of this that also are used by cities uh, to gain more detailed data about uh, commuter um, travel than, than what is possible with a survey. Um, I list some of those there. And I want to make the distinction with what would be used. This would not be a method or a technology that one would uh, like to use to implement a, a policy of congestion pricing. For that, you would want to put something in the cars, an, an onboard unit, a, a GPS unit that, that uh, uh, charges. This is very detailed data that comes out of this uh, type of exercise. So this is w um, the, the map here shows uh, the travel routes of one the data for one person on one particular day, how they go around in the city and they make a number of trips and a number of stays. Um, and uh, th again, this this is from the research side comes from the smartphone uh, data. So equipped with this data, the goal is to understand how commuters would respond to a congestion pricing scheme. In order to do that, the study participants uh, were received, um, were part of a, a treatment which involved congestion charges. Now, how did that work in practice? We gave them a virtual account. You can think of it as an easy pass account that was preloaded. We put money in there. We explained to them that this was their money. And then congestion charges were subtracted out of that. Because of course, we can't charge these study participants out of their pocket. Now, at the end of each week in the study, which lasted for around five weeks, whatever was left in the account was made as a bank transfer to their bank account. So they, uh, they, they pretty soon learned that this was real money and real uh, stakes uh, to the extent that, that, uh, that, they, that they wanted to. Now, there were two parts in this experiment. There were two types of congestion charges that were tested. Uh, the first one is a peak hour congestion charge. So that's the image on the top. That's a uh, type of uh, card that the study participants received. And uh, it, it shows that there's a peak hour that is, uh, that is charged uh, highly. And then there are these two parts at the beginning and at the end of the morning session where um, charges are going up gradually or going down. So that creates an incentive, at least in those uh, regions, to marginally change behavior, to make trips earlier or to make strips, uh, trips later. Uh, and this, by the way, was um, a per kilometer congestion charge. So longer trips were more expensive. Um, the second type of treatment and, and policy uh, studied was um, essentially a, a route choice or, or a congestion area charge. Um, this was highly personalized for technical reasons that have to do with the, with the study. Um, and in practice, it worked as there was an area that um, commuters were charged a flat fee amount if they drove through it. If they avoided it or if they did not make any trips, then they, they would not be charged for that. This created a detour option. So this was designed in such a way that commuters essentially, if they wanted to make a trip to their typical destination, they would either take the short route but pay or take a longer route um, but have it for free. So th these experiments are, the first one especially, aims to be related to something that's policy relevant. So it aims to look like uh, what a congestion pricing scheme might look in reality. Um, and they are, at the, the on the other hand, designed to um, enable us to learn about the relevant commuter preferences. So intuitively, from the first one, we learn how flexible people are to change when they travel, um, how flexible they change the, the, the timing of their trips. And from the second one, we learn something about value of time. So how much is someone willing to drive, uh, are they willing to drive five minutes extra in order to save uh, you know, 80 rupees in this case? Um, so the results that, that, that I want to discuss in Bangalore, the way that commuters responded to these two uh, experiments show that there's a moderate amount of flexibility in terms of leaving earlier in the morning. So people are uh, willing or some commuters are willing to advance their trips uh, in order to avoid charges. Uh, and there's a high value of time. So not many of them are willing to take detour uh, routes that, that, uh, that would save them money. Now, so 
so far, this tells something about how individual commuters would respond to pricing. However, if something like these policies were applied in the entire city, the traffic patterns and the congestion patterns would also change. So in order to, under to, to say something about what would happen, um, we need to understand to quantify the externality. And here, I, I'd like to see, in a way, in more settings, something like um, um, easily available data that would say, what is the social cost of making a particular trip? So I tried to do this exercise in Bangalore in terms of congestion. If I make a trip that lasts half an hour during the peak hour, uh, how many minutes of extra travel time will this create for everyone else in, uh, in Bangalore? And I used the GPS data that was collected to, to quantify this and using how many people travel at peak hours and how many how, uh, what, what travel times are at those times and compare them to times of the day when there's less congestion. Um, and the answer there was surprising. So uh, quantitatively, um, it's around half. So if I make a half hour trip, then I add a epsilon to everyone else uh, in the city and that adds up to around 15 minutes for everyone else. Uh, that's definitely not zero, there is an externality, but that um, compared to previous research that looks at highways and in other settings, this is orders of magnitude smaller. So one has the intuition that if you add another car when it's really, really congested, it, it has an outsized uh, cost on everyone else and that's not what we find in Bangalore. Um, and this may have something to do with uh, the road network in Bangalore, which is not showing here, but is very dense and uh, it's an urban road network. There are no highways, control access highways, and this is a feature of, uh, of the environment that may make it, um, that may limit actually the social cost even at peak hours. So this will be different in different cities, and this is the part of the toolkit that I think um, this type of measurement being done in different cities differently might give different results, and that would be very important for the final conclusions. Um, so the final part of the study is putting these two parts together. Um, so in a simulation environment, commuters have the flexibility and the value of time that arise from how real uh, commuters respond to the experiments, and externality is the, uh, the, externality is the, the one that I, that I mentioned before. And in this setting, we can do an exercise to ask, what is the current equilibrium, but also what would be the social optimum? What are the best congestion pricing, what is the best congestion pricing scheme to, to uh, implement, and how much better would that be than the status quo? Now, the interesting thing about the results here that, uh, that Alejandro um, uh, mentioned earlier is that there's a small deadway loss of congestion in this setting. So even the best optimal congestion charge where all the money gets recycled to, to commuters does not add much in terms of commuter welfare. And this has very much to do with the shape of the externality that I showed on the previous slide. Again, this may be different if tried in different cities. Um, and so to end, I, I want to mention, kind of propose this as a, as a potential way to understand ex ante before a policy gets implemented, how a road congestion pricing scheme would happen in other cities. Um, first measure um, uh, the externality or understand the social cost and then measure preferences using experiments. This can be done for the same dimensions as here or for how people substitute to public transport or not travel at all uh, and so on. Um, thank you, thanks a lot. Thank you, Gabriel. I, I was thinking that in Brussels there was some experiment too, uh, I guess somehow similar to what we are seeing here. Um, colleagues, I think we have uh, still 10 to 15 minutes of questions, so this is your opportunity. We have uh, in the panel a uh, transport regulator who is facing the, the difficulties to regulate the sector which is changing. Uh, we have two researchers, uh, you, you have seen them, and we have a policy advisor, so let's take advantage and is there any question? Okay. Um, Bruno Bert from Center on Regulation in Europe. So, uh, what is striking in the uh, five presentations we had? is the horizontal uh, character of the issues at stake uh, because we, we, we talk about 
regulating the use of public space. We talk about climate issues. We talk about congestion, and therefore, and, 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 and many others. And clearly, uh, that uh, uh, in terms of in, in terms of uh, regulation, it raises the the question of who is in charge, because we talk about regulators, and clearly uh, we have regulators in a number of the uh, for for a number of, of of the issues at stake. But we see clearly that without having a, a holistic. Uh, comprehension of, of the problems at stake and complex solutions which involve uh, the uh, responsibilities of the various regulators, we, we will not move forward. So the question is, uh, to the panel, is how what prospect do you see for enhanced cooperation between those who have, who share the responsibility for dealing and finding solutions, optimal solutions for the users, for the consumers, for the citizens uh, in, in this kind of problematic. Thank you. Maybe we can take one question more and then we let the panel, oh, there are many, so fantastic. So please. Uh, this is a quick question for Gabriel. The reason I think that you're not adding too much of extra cost when the car is uh, or vehicle is uh, traveling during peak hours is because your benchmark will also be fairly congested. So given Bengaluru's uh, sort of urban dense network, uh, I wonder what the off-peak was. Uh, and if the off-peak off itself is very congested, then you're not going to add too much or you're not going to get too much too much of a cost uh, addition when you're traveling in peak time. So I wonder if you sort of comment on that, whether that was the case, or whether you have descriptive statistics of uh, peak off peak. Mm. I would suggest that maybe Anne take the first question, Gabriel the second, and then we come to this side. That was one question too. I'm regulated by the chairman, so <laughs> uh, thank you for your question. Very, very difficult one. Um, the cooperation between um, regulators, in fact, it's even for one sector uh, with the same uh, legal basis like a European directive, for instance, in one particular sector like rail, it's, it's, it's difficult even if the missions are clear, are the same and in the same sector. So when you talk about several sectors and a uh, multimodal or intermodal approach, what would be the best congestion pricing scheme on the road sector in urban areas to impact and have benefits on other modes? And uh, this is something where, well, to my knowledge, there is no coordination uh, at the regulatory levels. Regulators have different statutes. Some are uh, public administration, public authorities. Others are ministries. Others are cities, local authorities, group of cities, region. So it's uh, an institutional question um, as well as a technical and economic question because uh, measuring the externalities, being able to measure and uh, uh, evaluate, assess the, the proper level of optimal uh, pricing and uh, and the uh, the real the, the the effect it has on behaviors uh, is is difficult. So, to my knowledge, there is there is no coordination with a holistic approach like the one you uh, you advocate, uh, which is a, a a big brother approach of uh, regulation. <laughs> uh, even for rail, the rail regulators at the European level with the same directive, they have different approach and it's not, it's not so easy to coordinate. So sorry to disappoint you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, great, so um, thanks for the question. That, that, that's fantastic and I wanna make two points. One is indeed, so uh, let me tell you the numbers and you'll judge whether this is slow or fast. So Bangalore on average uh, at nighttime um, uh, the speed is around 30 kilometers per hour. 
um, and so two minutes per kilometer if you if you invert it. Um, and then at peak hour, on average, it's around uh, half uh, half of that, or, or it takes twice as long. So I think this falls somewhere where it's uh, it's not uh, it's obviously not fast, but it's also not uh, extremely slow. It's on par with something like uh, Manhattan, um, uh, I believe. Um, the other part is um, it so. I, is it wh why, why is it the fact that the, these costs are, 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 are kind of very gradual? And it may have to do with some specific, something more general about road networks rather than uh, Bangalore uh, itself. Uh, so uh, the holy grail in a way in, 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 uh, in um, uh, congestion pricing and in understanding externalities is that if you think of highways, there is a sense that there is a very nonlinear relationship between how many cars there are on the road and average speeds. At some point, adding the additional car is going to break down everything and there will be a huge slowdown. And that may be a phenomenon that just doesn't happen in road networks where the, this, this transition is much more gradual. Thank you. Thank you. Let me add that regarding the coordination of regulation or regulator is that in many cities there is a transport authority, uh, but when you have different subnational levels of governments uh, and in developing countries, sometimes they are not uh, transport authorities. And these transport authorities sometimes are also playing by default a role of regulation, of regulators, so which is a bit confused where provide and, and regulate, but it's more complex in, in many other cities. Please. Yeah, uh, my question will also be directed at Mr. Kindler. So um, at your data collection, I thought, would there be a problem with selection bias? Because drivers who decide to participate in the study might be more spontaneous and more price sensitive. But if there is, then actually that would be also uh, more in support of your uh, finding of a moderate effect, because then it could be even smaller if the drivers who don't decide to participate might uh, be less willing to change their uh, routes. So do you address that? Or? Thanks very much. That's a fantastic question. So I want to say two things. One is, uh, so this is absolutely a very important challenge. And uh, what I do in the paper is we try to say something about it and not a fully satisfying answer. So we collect some data about everyone that surveyors approach. We see they are slightly younger. They are kind of the same mix between motorcycle and car owners, which already gives you a sense that there's a that's good because I, I, I was afraid that only motorcycle uh, drivers, which are kind of lower income on average, would have participated. That's not the case. The, the other thing to say is I guess there's a full spectrum, so a very established method in uh, transportation economics and in actual studies that cities do is to do stated preferences studies. So with a survey sample, ask hypothetical scenarios. Imagine you had to choose between this and this, what would you prefer? And there you may get a better sample However, there may be a cost in terms of how realistic those responses are because they are hypothetical. So these kinds of experiments go at, a, I think, exactly in the direction that you said, that uh, they may have more selection problems and perhaps the response is more realistic. That's the hope. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, hi, my name is Vivian Foster from the World Bank. I have a couple of, of questions that cut quite broadly across the panel. Um, first of all, of course, we economists dream about road pricing, um, and it's now really quite feasible, but we know that politically it's, it's extremely difficult to implement. Konstantinos encouraged us to think about regulating road access. So, you know, is it possible to imagine a situation where instead of peak charging, we actually regulate occupancy rates during peak periods and we apply fines to those who violate occupancy rate restrictions. Is that a potential way to go? Could, could the ART become uh, a regulator of access to the road space? It, it, it's, it's had a sort of mission creep over the last few years. Is that a possible future? Uh, secondly, I was really struck by the contrast in the access to transit data between New York and Paris with ART now having this uh, you know, authority to demand uh, data from providers, uh, whereas in New York the situation was much more difficult. Um, clearly data is these days regarded as an economic resource. Uh, how does, in the French legal system, how do you handle the fact that this data that you're seeking from the companies has economic value? Uh, how, how have you managed to, to, to handle that question? Uh, thank you for your question. <coughs> Uh, you raise a very interesting point. Um, we all know congestion pricing uh, has been uh, an issue uh, since it appeared uh, like 30 years ago. Uh, for, what regard, uh, for what regards the fairness in the uh, adoption um, towards different uh, categories of uh, people from different um, economic backgrounds. Um, 
I strongly believe that what you say uh, can be done. Uh, there is a technology that uh, could um, uh, apply charging on the basis of the occupancy of vehicles. Uh, so far, there are examples uh, where uh, lanes are dedicated to high occupancy vehicles, and I don't see why using technology, uh, something similar cannot be done for, uh, for charging. But even that case, I mean, uh, um, uh, lane occupancy, uh, it's still an indirect way to prioritize or deprioritize uh, occupancy of uh, vehicles. Yeah, just to add to the to the answer. I mean, I agree with the the, the concerns raised that there's a, there's a risk that if there there are no substitutes, this can become basically a, a tax. Uh, one thing I think is useful to think about is that uh, not if we should kind of go beyond the average user idea. I mean, so at a time when I am uh, I might be a transit user, also affected by congestion. But I might be a transit user, but when I'm in a hurry, I might want the option for the road not to be as as congested. When I'm in a medical emergency, I might have a very high stakes on the road serving a, a different speed. There's also other tools, such as, for instance, I mean, one of the tools we want to have, you know, the potential for substitution is the difference between the price between transit and riding uh, uh, and, and congestion uh, pricing. So another policy lever is the price of transit. Um, and about the issue of, uh, of occupancy, I think that's interesting, and certainly there's some technology in some places in place because of enforcement of high occupancy vehicle uh, lanes. However, I would also mention that to the if, if, the, if the congestion charge is high enough, people can also endogenously carpool to share that charge, right? When there's a paper kind of that uh, highlights that concept. So th th we don't miss out on that with high charge. High charges also kind of target that. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, just quick answers, maybe. On the occupancy rate pricing, there are two experiments. One is today, or for what it, it's since last week in, in Paris, where uh, it's not charged, but I mean, uh, the, uh, the car uh, uh, who share more than three people, where, where there are more than three people in Paris are able to use the bus lines. Well, there are no buses actually right now, but I mean, in terms of, in terms of uh <laughs> of time spent, uh, this is an experiment. The other one is that the uh, highway concessionaires, they are now uh, asking for money to invest in dedicated lines for car share sharing, and they will, uh, they will apply a reduced fare, a reduced toll to, uh, to the, the, the cars using this, uh, this uh, dedicated line. So this is a, a project. As for the economic value of, uh, of the data provided by company, first of all, the obligation to provide data transport data, dynamic as well as static data on public and private transport modes uh, is a, a European uh, obligation. So uh, it's not uh, something that national regulatory agencies have imposed, but it's a European uh, regulation. So that's the first part of it. And as regard the value of this, of this data, uh, what is required so far, but once again, the law hasn't been adopted. Huh? Uh, is to provide um, anonymized data to the regulator. What we need is anonymized data. And what the uh, local authorities who will use this data to create a multi multimodal platform, information platform, uh, are not um, uh, data that uh, with confidentiality issues. It's uh, the uh, supply, the different characteristics of the, of the supply of transport services uh, and and uh, as well as the disturbance, the, the different uh, uh, disturbance of, of the traffic and the quality of service. So it's much more this type of data than data on the users, on the final users. We will use uh, data. We will try to get data from final users, but we have confidentiality uh, um, uh, clause and conditions and type of contract that we sign. We are an, an authority. We have uh, we uh, we have lots of obligation and and duties when it comes to privacy and confidentiality. So there is a a chart that uh, we have signed uh, with uh, with the operators who provide data on a very individual basis. I would like to add, uh, Bibi, and that probably you know that in Washington and in Virginia, the 495 and the I-66, uh, basically you have a subsidy charge, uh, subsidy uh, re a reduction in the price of the toll if you have a vehicle with high occupation. You need to buy a special transponder and you need to switch 
the transported in order that you show that, and it will be a, it will be taking a picture whether you are bringing these people, no? And there are people that are faking passengers, right? This is another story. So, is there any uh, other question for the speaker? Please, Gabriel. I, I, I want to thank you. I, I want to mention one very quick idea on the issue of distributional concerns. D uh, one idea is to think uh, basically in the direction of the second welfare theorem, is it possible to do some type of redistribution to alleviate those concerns? So something that as technology improves, one may think of is having a mobility credit that one can use to pay these kinds of prices that goes to certain groups that we think are uh, don't have substitution. And so that may help, uh, although some more questions. I would like to thank to the five speakers. Uh, I hope that Yannick was able to, to continue listening to us. Thanks so much for your presentation and for making it to, to Toulouse. Thank you.